welcome everyone and thanks for joining us. Um, today we are having one of our uh, most popular uh, workshops at the RESI conference that's been going on for quite a few years now, uh, sponsored by McDermott, Will and Emery, um, talking about the important topic of negotiating term sheets. And um, I would like to welcome our panelists today. Uh, we have David Hendren of Augmentum Ventures, uh, Mark uh, Mihanovich of MWE, uh, Aroma Sharma, also of MWE, and um, Isaac Stoner is CEO of Octagon Therapeutics in the greater Boston area um, to give the perspective of a fundraising company. So um, thank you all very much for being here and uh, um, looking forward to hearing the discussion. Thank, thank you, Greg. Um, and thanks uh, everyone for, for joining us for the Term Sheets Workshop. Uh, this workshop is intended to provide guidance to entrepreneurs and senior management of early stage companies that are in the process of negotiating term sheets for equity financing transactions or anticipating to be at that stage uh, in the uh, near medium future. Again, my name is Mark Mahanovic. I've been a corporate transactions attorney for uh, 35 years. I practice uh, out of our offices in Silicon Valley in Los Angeles, and I'm the partner in charge of the California Transactions Group of McDermott, Will & Emory, which is a 1200 attorney international law firm. I also head up McDermott's Emerging Companies and Venture Capital Practice. I'll be moderating the excellent panel we have gathered to discuss equity financing term sheets over the next 50 minutes to an hour with panelists, bringing perspectives from different sides of the process. As mentioned, David Hendren is a managing director of Augmentum Advisors, a consulting business advisory and management firm advising and partnering with entrepreneurs, startups, and also more mature companies and investors, as well as R&D organizations, deal sponsors, and management. David began his career as a corporate lawyer. He likes to say he's a recovering uh, corporate lawyer and has had leadership roles on all sides of the table, including the venture capital investor and uh, being the entrepreneur and CEO. Isaac Stoner, as mentioned, is the founder and CEO of Octagon Therapeutics, a drug discovery company developing targeted medicines for autoimmune disease. He has spent his, his career as an operator and investor in the biotech space, having been an early team member at Genome Corp and Firefly Bioworks. He spent time as an investor at Action Potential Venture Capital and Pure Tech Health, and is currently an advisor to KDT Ventures. And Aroma Sharma is also a partner in the Silicon Valley Office Transactions Group of McDermott, Will and Emery. Aroma for, focuses her practice on, on a wide range of corporate and transactional matters, including advising emerging companies and equity and debt financing transactions in various industries, including technology, healthcare, and life sciences. So I'll start by saying we would like for this uh, panel discussion to be interactive, uh, not only among panelists, but, but also with the audience. So um, we would be happy to have uh, I will certainly expect to save some time at the end of the session for questions, but uh, folks can also uh, feel free to, to utilize the Q&A function during the session, and we will try to respond timely. So we're going to start by spending a, 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 some, a few minutes on brief comments on, on, on general issues regarding term sheets and the goals and purposes of term sheets and a venture capital investment, which will typically involve preferred stock, uh, a venture capital investment, and early round equity of a company. Uh, first, it is important to recognize that there are different philosophies regarding term sheets and not necessarily one size that fits all. Some of you might have heard about NVCA or the Nat National Venture Capital Association, which provides a great deal of information relating to VC investments, including model forms for all kinds of different transaction documents. And those model forms include a form for a Series A preferred stock term sheet which can be a good frame of reference for you with, with customary terms and also provides annotations and footnotes explaining various provisions. But many venture capital firms use their own term sheet forms and, and those forms can differ from VC to VC, uh, including as to length and levels of detail. A, a general purpose of the term sheet is to set forth the basic business, economic and structural terms of the propo proposed investment. This allows the company and the principal investor to assess whether there is high level agreement on transaction terms prior to incurring the time and effort and expense of performing due diligence and negotiating 
uh, more detailed definitive documentation. We will walk through some of those term sheet terms shortly, but generally the terms relating to the transaction are expressly stated as non-binding. Now there is case law in certain jurisdictions to the effect that a non-binding term sheet can in specific circumstances create a, a binding obligation to, to negotiate in good faith. Um, but uh, we're not gonna spend a lot of time on that. Uh, and frankly, that poses potentially a bigger risk to the investor than to the company entrepreneur when it's, uh, when it's actually invoked. But there are uh, generally the, the, trans the transaction terms are non-binding as described, but there are typically some limited binding clauses that appear in the term sheet, including an exclusivity clause under the, which the company agrees to only provide diligence to and, and, and negotiate with specific, um, pardon me, with specific, specific investor for 30 or 45 or 60 days, and perhaps a confidentiality provision and an expense reimbursement provision. Uh, a, nugget of, a nugget of advice for founders and companies out there is to make sure that any expense reimbursement obligation, which you can negotiate a cap on, is only triggered upon closing of the financing so that you're not required to pay for investors' expenses if the transaction for whatever reason doesn't close and you don't receive the investment funds. So the discussion today will focus on terms of an initial priced equity series A round. Before we go there, perhaps uh, we can spend a couple of times and Aroma can spend a couple of minutes on pre-series A or seed rounds, including convertible notes and safes, which are instruments that allow your company to raise money without having to set a valuation or at least a, a precise valuation for the company. Uh, Aroma? Yeah, sure. Um, so the the mechanism um, that your company uses to, to raise funds um, really depends on a multitude of factors, including the size of the round, um, the valuation and price, and, and who the key players are in terms of your investors, um, and, and honestly, what they're comfortable with at that time. Um, oftentimes, the, uh, there are um, instruments such as convertible notes um, or safes that are used for seed rounds, um, oftentimes before the Series A, um, but after um, your, your friends and family round. Um, and convertible notes, um, as the name kind of implies, is essentially a promissory note um, that is either repaid at the maturity date or um, converts into equity um, upon your next uh, true preferred equity financing round. Um, so these are often instruments that are very friendly for early stage companies in the sense that um, the company can get, get the capital outright but not have to um, raise funds through a true preferred equity round um, in the terms of selling its shares um, at that time. However, you are committing to sell shares at the next um, round to, to the investors that invest through the note. Um, then there's also the safe, which is um, acts very similarly to the convertible note. Um, a safe is short for um, simple agreement for future um, equity. Um, it's a um, alternative to the convertible note that's, that was introduced by Y Combinator, um, a Silicon Valley startup accelerator. And um, the, the, per, the, the key differentiator between the safe and something like a convertible note is that a safe um, doesn't have a maturity date. So when an investor invests through a safe instrument, um, they are, um, th they're, they're giving you cash up front um, with the idea that their, um, that their capital will be converted into um, shares at the next financing round without any sort of maturity date um, tied to it. Um, so investors are often um, open to investing through these mechanisms if they have um, some investor friendly terms such as a valuation cap or discounts. Um, and uh, one advantage for both the convertible note and a safe is that um, for both stockholders and the company is that it somewhat pushes off the need to need to determine the valuation um, of the company at that time. Yeah, if there's a valuation cap. Uh, you know, you, you aren't determining the precise valuation, although you are capping your valuation uh, uh, for purposes of, of uh, measurement against the next round at that cap. Aroma, what are you seeing in terms of uh, 
discounts. Typically, these are discounts against the the next round pricing. So, what what are typical percentages for the discounts? Um, I think twenty percent is pretty standard. I, anywhere between, I think, fifteen to twenty five. I've I've seen, um, but I definitely will not go north of that. <laughs> So the investor for, for you know a, a, with a 10% or 15 or 20% discount receives the same terms as the subsequent investors in the in the, in the in the first price round, which would be a Series A round, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Great. It's a, it's a pretty simple mechanism, and and uh, and it works very well, and can result in early capital coming in uh, pretty quickly, and it has those benefits. Um, it does push off the valuation discussion. We'll, we'll undoubtedly, in the context of discussing term sheets, talk about how uh, investors look at valuation. But there are a couple of pitfalls in the, in the convertible notes in the sense that, and, and you know, looking at these, whether it's a note or a safe, which is effectively the same thing, but a couple of different bells and whistles, um, it gives the the investor the benefit of being at the top of the capital stack because it's debt for as long as it exists. Um, and in the you ask, well, wait a minute, why would you have that conversion? Um, well, a lot of those early investors, whether they're friends and family, whether they are less sophisticated angels or even more sophisticated angels. Uh, can say okay, I'll I'll put my capital in, and the time frame to maturity really kind of needs to correspond to some period for being able to get a, an equity round done. And the reason you typically put an evaluation cap and a discount is uh, that, of course, on that early money, you're creating value and reducing risk that enables getting something done that enables you to uh, to get a priced round done. So, of course, it makes sense to give a discount, but people can really trick that up. They can say, well, I'll give you a discount, but if it takes me a little longer to do the round, I'll give you more discount or warrants or this, that, and the other thing. And the cautionary tale is not doing something that's so complicated that it it uh, creates friction when it comes time to do the priced round. There needs to be a reasonable relationship between the discount uh, and the, and the priced round. So we've seen the oh, in the dark now. We've seen the exact same thing happen. Nothing messes up your conversation with with. The potential equity investors in Series A, than having a lot of convertible notes on different terms, on different discounts, on different caps, try and make things as plain vanilla and hold the line and keep things as plain vanilla as you can. Don't don't get cute. Don't get creative. Listen to your counsel. We had a lot of lawyers on the panel. That's that's very good advice, Isaac. Uh, you, you know, this is a good segue. You know, talking about because uh, I do think we want to talk. You know, hit valuation at, uh, up front here. A key term, obviously, that's going to appear in the term sheet is the valuation of the company uh, in order to determine the per share price will be paid by the the investors. And I'd like to you know turn back to David and Isaac to discuss kind of initial valuations and the process to get there. Each of you guys has been you know involved in multiple sides of of this process. Isaac, I'll, I'll start with you. You know, how should an entrepreneur go about determining the right or appropriate valuation for his or her company, which the company might be pre-income, it might be pre-revenue. Perhaps it's you know we're in a kind of an idea and some technology and intellectual property around the idea and maybe some other assets, but the pre-revenue potentially when you're doing your first price round. How, how do you go about determining appropriate valuation? Yeah, so we're we're a biotech. We're going to be pre-revenue for a long time, maybe the better part of a decade, right? Which is just the name of the game. Um, in terms of how to start, typically the way that I would go about that is you know, one actually build out the the NPV model, the discounted cash flow model, around when our product will get to market. So you know if we're finally bringing a drug to market in 2029 or whatever, it's going to be a while, um, and then we work backwards from that you know revenue stream. What does that look like with industry standard discount rates? And then you know once that model's built, you can begin to ne negotiate around. Well, really this should be a 35% discount rate, not 40 or 30, not 35. Um, so that's where I start, but 
then that'll be thrown out the window, right? At the end of the day, for a pre-revenue company, your valuation is what the market will bear. And so that's when it really turns into process. How good are you at running the process and getting multiple folks around the table at the same time who are interested and maybe aren't colluding behind your back with one another and, and kind of beating you up on the valuation. So you know, that's when it comes time to really make sure you're, you're leveraging your network and then the network beyond your network to make sure that you're, you're engaged with the right venture firms, the right firms that are strategically aligned, that you know, are not predatory and, and you have enough different folks in process that, that they're not just gonna form one solid syndicate and dictate terms that you can't turn down. So a long-winded way of saying you start with the real kind of financial modeling piece, and then really it's all about how you run that financing process. Yeah, and I might add, so look, you know, valuation for something, particularly in, in an illiquid market, is what a, what a willing buyer will buy for and what a willing seller will sell for, okay? And when you're uh, you can get kind of cute and tricky. The, the reality is uh, that investors look at it in, uh, you know, I would, I would say there are sort of four, uh, four things that you need to think about. One is, what are the comparables? And the comparables are going to vary by things like, you know, what is the stage? What are the risks to develop? What is the industry? Uh, what's your business model? Um, the other things, and, and sort of you, you, you throw that in a little bit of a bucket and you figure out, okay, well, so what are other comparable, you know, what are the comparables uh, in terms of industry, in terms of uh, stage, in terms of size around? Uh, the other things you need to factor in, there are some sort of adjustment factors, okay? If you've got a team of rock stars, you're going to get a little higher valuation. If you got a lot more to prove, you're going to get a little less valuation um, because investors are going to look at two variables. You know, what are the risks presented to me here? And, uh, and what are the, you know, what's the value? And, and what are the steps that I'm paying for as an investor at a particular stage to enable this company to realize a particular value? The other things... Um, that certainly uh, nearly every venture firm is going to do and more sophisticated angels are going to do is they're going to have a sense of what the target equity is that they need to hold for a particular investment. And, um, and I, I don't think there's anything wrong with not only doing your homework, uh, but also asking, how much of the company do you need to own at a particular stage? Uh, because if you know that a target, uh, uh, a target ownership level is sort of you know eighteen to twenty five percent for a particular round, it doesn't make sense if you've got uh, if you're coming to a number where it's gonna that investor is gonna be presented with ownership of ten percent, um, and the other aspect there is you may be in a position where you're kind of on the bubble and you can have a conversation about, well, you know, well, maybe you ought to invest a little bit more here to get your, your, your value. The other thing is in terms of comparables, there's a market out there. So if you're able to have multiple firms competing to fund you, uh, you can float up a little higher in the range. The other thing to consider and that, that venture investors will consider is, what does the potential exit look like? And a couple of variables need to be taken into consideration for that, okay? If you, if you say, okay, we know this investor is targeting a 10X on a successful investment, you have to then figure out what does that mean in terms of a, a terminal value for this company's shares either when it gets liquid as a public company or in a, a sale of a company. And you also need to factor in how much dilution is going to happen along the way. So obviously these are all rough factors to, to figure in, but part of negotiating from the company side is understanding how the investors 
uh, think about it. But at the end of the day, you kind of got to be close enough for horseshoes and hand grenades. It doesn't, you know, a lot of people can blow up a deal uh, because they take it as a matter of pride. I got to get the last nickel of valuation out. And the fact of the matter is good investors, as you're moving forward, they're going to make sure that the management team is adequately incentivized. And if they need to... Uh, if they need to make adjustments along the way and refresh options, they do it. So, uh, so you, you got to be close enough and and do your homework, but also don't blow up your deal because you you're trying to get cute about the last penny of valuation. I think that's a great point too. A lot of people get way too focused on valuation. There are terms in your term sheet that might actually be more important, right? Do you still control the board? Can you be fired on day one after closing your venture financing? So you, there, there are things that maybe you should pay more attention to than getting caught up on, you know, am I a 25 million pre or a 50 million pre or a, you know, 10 million pre? Uh, I think they're finding the right investor is, is more important than haggling over valuation. Uh, there's a question from the audience. Uh, uh, how do you find out that target equity? I didn't think that that information was in investment databases like pitch books. Ask. What do you need to own? You know what, and and uh, and investors will tell you. Uh, I like to own this much. And you also can work backward because in, in pitch book and, and other sources, you can figure out what the cap table looks like uh, to understand the valuation of a round and, and how much people own. David, maybe can you talk a little bit about how investors you know, view pre-money and post-money valuations and particularly including how equity incentive plan uh, numbers are, are factored in? Well, you know, depending on your stage, you're going to you're going to factor in uh, a, a, an incentive equity pool. Um, and that's another, by the way, uh, going to to uh, Isaac's comment, there can be other issues you need to, to think about. And this is where having good experienced counsel, um, it really helps a lot. Um, you can have things like whether that option pool is put in place in advance, after financing, uh, how big that option pool is. Um, so, um, you know, there, there are a bunch of variables to consider uh, there. Um, is, it, is that helpful? I'm not sure I completely- Yeah, no, it, it is. I mean, I, you know, I think, you know, the way investors often look at it is they'll say, here's what we're going to assume your option pool is going to be. And here's frankly how, how big we need it to be. And then we're going to base our fully diluted valuation calculation, looking at the, at the full capitalization, assuming not just the options that are granted, not just the options that are granted and invested, but the options that are in the pool that we assume that in the next year or two, you're going to have to, you're going to be uh, utilizing. Yeah. And a lot of people get very uh, sort of get baffled by the concept of pre-money valuation and post-money valuation. And the, the basic concept is this, when you negotiate a pre-money valuation, that says what is the enterprise value uh, that your investors are gonna buy a piece of. So for sake of uh, uh, easy math, uh, you say, okay, so if your pre-money valuation is $10 million and I'm putting in five, it means that I'm putting in five to buy $5 million worth of what would exist before. That's done by issuing new shares. So you have an incremental set of shares. So what are the variables at play there that can affect the outcome? One is how much money is going in, because if you've got the pre-money valuation um, and you've got all of the option pool built into that pre-money valuation, okay, that all is part of what exists and, and new, money's, new money's going in on top of. So uh, part of the discussion is how much, uh, how much, how big does that option pool need to be 
uh, which is kind of a, a, you know, the question becomes who's sharing the risk for putting in place options to build the team beyond that option pool. Yeah, yeah no, I think that's, that's uh, well said. And I, I think it ties into your earlier point, which is what percentage of the company does the VC wanna own for the amount to be invested? And that percentage is usually tied to a fully diluted number, not the out number of outstanding, outstanding shares. Isaac, I'm interested in your perspective. How, how often do you get into a little bit of a, a, you know, there's obviously on one side of the fence, you want to make sure you've got sufficient options to, you know, be able to grant, grow your team, et cetera, et cetera, in your option pool. And you're expecting everyone to see that. On the other hand, it is potentially, if, if that pool is assumed to be bigger than you might think is necessary, you actually might have to be in the counterintuitive uh, posture of saying, I don't need a pool quite that big. And I certainly don't want that factored in in terms of my initial valuation. Does that come up? I think it always does, right? So I you know I always say, oh no, that option pool needs to be created before the before the investment comes in, and that you know not our, after the investment comes in, not before the investment comes in. Um, I think the number is ten percent. They think the number is fifteen percent. So there's always a negotiation that happens there, and I say that's as valid a negotiation as as your pre money, right? So that's a significant chunk of of equity that's that's being you know, created or or taken off the table depending on how you're looking at it so yes that is always a key term um and you know i'd say rule of thumb that i've seen is is kind of 10 to 15 percent and you know that'll that'll always be created before the venture money comes in uh, unless you're really able to pull something off isaac as you're looking at valuation and i think david mentioned before maybe you did as well it's not necessary to get to the last dollar and, and it's, it's probably not wise to be pushing and fighting etc from that perspective no, are, you also and, looking, are you also looking at in the context of a continuum where you want to see kind of a steady rise in stock price? You want to avoid at all times that down round uh, dynamic? Yes. And, and I do think as well, you know, there are ways of, of getting too high a pre-money valuation where you effectively close off what could be really, really solid outcomes for you. For example, you know, an early exit, if you say you say you do a smaller financing on a smaller valuation, but now all of a sudden a, a $50 million exit you know, it gets your investors their forex, and and by the way, now you're you know now you're walking away with ten million dollars in your pocket. That that could be pretty good. So people get very fixated on getting the biggest pre money they can get, um, and the biggest financing they can get. But you can really get ahead of yourself there. So so making sure again you're in line with the comps to David's point, and you kind of start with your your uh, assumed exit in mind. Here's what the exit is going to look like. Here's how much cash it's going to take me to get there and work backwards to something that's really a reasonable pre-money. I think that's that's much more effective a way to go rather than just trying to scrabble to get the number as big as you can on that pre. Okay. So, so you know, we've discussed obviously a critical threshold element for the term sheet, which is the evaluation, but there are a number of other issues. And Isaac alluded to this earlier that obviously are going to be covered in the term sheet. And uh, Aroma, perhaps if you could spend a few minutes talking about some of the other key terms for the transaction that are generally covered in the in the term sheet, you know, liquidation preferences, participation rights, anti-dilution, the others. Yeah, definitely. So often the terms that you're going to set in these early stage investments sets um, a precedent for your future financing rounds. Um, you will often not get better terms. Um, you won't get better company terms um, than you will um, at this first priced round. Um, so I'll, I'll run through some of these key economic terms, key liquidity terms, and um, some of the key control terms that, um, that Isaac alluded to as well. Um, so in terms of the economics, um, liquidation preference um, is probably uh, first and foremost. Um, that, that determines who gets paid out first. Um, so your preferred shareholders are going to get paid out their preference amount. Um, before any of the common stockholders get paid out. Generally, founders in a company um, will be will hold common stock. So um, that's just an important um, point to keep in mind. Um, oftentimes, the, the preference for these early stage rounds is equal to the amount that is initially invested, being the, the original purchase price, um, plus accrued dividends. Um, uh, but it could be a multiple of, of that price. Um, and then um, kind of going hand in hand with the liquidation preference is a, is a participation feature. Um, will these investors, will these preferred investors be able to 
um, cash out their preference and then also participate um, with, with the rest of the proceeds with the common holders. Um, in, in my experience, again, for, for these early stage rounds, um, the participation feature is a little bit more rare. Um, oftentimes the, these um, uh, preferred holders will be non-participating preferred. Um, but David, Isaac, if you guys have different opinions, feel free to jump in. <laughs> um, it depends, but I think non-participating preferred is more common. Yeah, and these things, you know, these things vary on on market. Uh, when there's when there's a lot more capital around, the terms get uh, get a little more favorable to to companies. And um, you know, but there's some stuff that you know a lot of this stuff, and I and I would um, uh, commend you to Mark's uh, uh, observation early on, and and I think also Aromas that. It's really helpful for some of the nuts and bolts that that Aroma is describing. Just take a look at the annotated NVCA term sheet because it takes you through some of them, and um, and make sure you've got good competent counsel to to walk you through these because some of it it's going to vary by what's going on in the market at a particular time, but something like the participation feature. Um, you know, they can greatly affect the outcome because you get your liquidation preference and then you convert. And after you've gotten all your money off the table, then you are converting into common. Well, that basically gives you another one X. Um, you know, are there circumstances for phasing that out, for example? Uh, uh, are there circumstances for phasing out your accrued dividend? Um, so these are some of the things that that good experience counsel can help you walk through as as solutions. And I think so, you know the way a way to think about that is, and, and maybe this is self evident. I mean, you you as an entrepreneur are, are an expert at building businesses, and maybe you've done you know several deals, and and as a result, you've been through the the, the drill uh, several times, and, and maybe well equipped. But for those who are doing it the first or second time, you may be you know ter terrific at building your business, but you're negotiating across the table from venture capitalists and who this is all they do uh, is do transactions. And so, um, uh, you know, obviously making sure at the front end before you start getting going on the term sheet, uh, you, get, you know, have, have counsel help you out. Uh, there are times when counsel will receive a term sheet and say, okay, can you, do, can you do the documents or help me with the definitive documents? Well, in the context of a VC investment, a lot of the meat is in the term sheet as we're discussing right now. And, uh, and, the, and the game is uh, you know, three quarters over at that point. So. I think I said that, that it can't be overstated how important it is to get counsel who does it day after day after day, right? So, you know, I, I always look at it as, as similar to, say you're an operator and you spend your career building companies, maybe you'll go through four, maybe five M&A experiences in your life, whereas there could be a specialized counsel who does an M&A deal every three or four weeks, right, for 10 years, uh, and you're just never going to match that level of experience. So get the right counsel involved. And neither Aroma nor I have bribed either Isaac or David to, uh, to well, say the, the other thing is, uh, you know, you should educate yourself in advance of the process. And you need to pick your battles very carefully. Some of the, uh, you know, some of the stuff is, is there. If you think about it, look, there, there are a couple of scenarios that an investor and, and frankly, you as the operator uh, needs to think about. One is, uh, you know, what happens if everything goes swimmingly and, and you, you know, you blow the doors off and have a huge success. Everybody's happy, okay? And then you you get into uh, you know some of the decision making around things like when to exit, et cetera, et cetera. But the downside is what's baked into a lot of the terms as well. And if you think about it, your capital is going to expect to have its its priority and preference and get paid first if there's not enough to go around. Okay. And there's no point in fighting that uh, because that's, that's what's expected. Um, there are certain things that go in as protective provisions and, and uh, uh, vetoes over certain decisions. And uh, you know, 
those are not a points of pride. It's just, it's perfectly reasonable to set things like uh, caps on amounts of debt that can, can be put on the company or uh, circumstances for, for selling or, or not. Uh, so some of those things that, you know, you can negotiate around the margins, but pick your battles very carefully. And because remember that until you actually close your financing, every term sheet will say that, it, you know, the, the completion of the transaction is subject to completion of due diligence. And from the investor's perspective, that due diligence is going until that moment that it pushes a button on wires and signs documents. And the process of getting the deal done, including that early process of negotiating a term sheet, is part of that diligence. From the investor's perspective, the investor is asking, can we work with these people? Can we work through difficult issues that can be points of disagreement and where in some cases you got to negotiate to an outcome? And that can be done in a way that's very businesslike, where people are picking their battles, where they're listening to each other, where they're making accommodations, or it can be done in a, uh, in a way that's all about ego, winning points. And that, that also goes to the, the selection of, of experienced counsel that are very professional because they know where to say no. They know where to say yes. They know where to counsel you. Uh, to you know, to pick a battle or to accept the fact that the market is a particular way on a particular term. Isaac, let's talk a little bit about control and and, and what's your perspective on? We can talk about the board in a second here, but let's let's talk about protective provisions. What's your perspective on that? I mean, David indicated, look, you can probably make some changes around the edges, but some of most of the basic protective provisions are going to be you know going to be kind of in place. But when you get into things like that are somewhat operational, like budgets, setting budgets and approval of budgets and variations off of budgets, what, again, Isaac, what's your perspective on protective provisions? How do you how tightly do you negotiate those? Yeah, so I, I mean, I, I think a lot of it depends on personal preference. Some people have a very strong control orientation. I view you know working with investors as real partners, right? I want them to be value add on my board. I don't want uh, to be in a contentious relationship from day one. Um, I don't want someone who's looking over my shoulder on every budgeting decision, right? I want to find investors who trust me to do, do the operational things. But when it comes to setting corporate strategy, right, making real, real important decisions for the business, that's where I, I tend to open things up. I want to have a board that's really, you know, that, that are partners in that kind of strategy setting and corporate governance side. Um, so I'd say I draw the line at data. The operational stuff. I don't want anyone breathing down my neck. I, I have absolutely no problem with getting together with investors as partners once a quarter to, for, for you know, full-on board strategy sessions. And, and in terms of the board, uh, Isaac, as you're negotiating the term sheet up front and usually in the term sheet, there are going to be you know discussion of how many board seats there will be and who's, who's receiving the board seats. Kind of how, in, in terms of the first round of financing, how do you look at that? Right. So, you know, we've done all convertible debt into the business to date. We're just working on our first equity financing now for Octagon. Right now, we haven't even bothered putting a functional board in place. It's myself and one other co-founder, and, and he votes whatever way I tell him, which is great. It's not always going to be that way, right? So, you know, what we're working towards now is a board composition where it's two founders, two people representing the investor side, and one independent. So it'll be a kind of standard five-person board. We'll have additional investors added um, kind of as we continue to, to grow the business. But we're, we're planning on having five person board with kind of equal founder and investor representation and, and one tiebreaker who we both agree on. Um, and I think that'll that'll function very well as long as we get the right syndicate, you know, people who are strategically aligned on how to build a business around the table. Yeah. And, and you know, from, from the perspective of the investor, you know, I was, I was talking about the due diligence of the investors toward the company. Um, it, it's also an, op, uh, an opportunity for the company to do some homework on the sources of capital to understand, okay, so how does this firm work? How do these, uh, because you, you know, a, a board can either be enormously supportive and helpful, and you know, somebody's making an investment. Uh, yeah, I mean, you can have control orientation. The fact of the matter is, 
uh, if things are not being done by consensus at the board, you're really in trouble. And so, you know, selection of good board members, including, and I, and I have a strong bias toward uh, a building to, to have outside directors included in the mix as, uh, you know, uh, pretty early. Because uh, it's not just about counting noses for votes. It's really about the perspective and the experience and the, the networks uh, that are going to support the mission. Because at the end of the day, the investor is making that investment in the company because it wants to align its interest in maximizing the success for that company. Okay, so you all have a shared mission and uh, board composition is a very important uh, thing. And it's, you know, it's a tell where uh, people are very insecure, very combative about the composition of the board. And I, and I agree with Isaac that that, you know, that early board, you don't want to cast of thousands. Um, and that's another thing that can happen is you get too big a board too, uh, too early uh, and it's unwieldy. David's point around about diligence going both way. I think that's really important as well. You know, make sure you're doing your homework on the investors. Make sure if they do take board seats, you know how they behave. You ought to be able to find a way to other management teams within their existing portfolio. Find the other portfolio companies. Sit down with the management teams and, and say, you know, how are these folks to work with? Are they, are they, you know, what's your experience been over the past few years since they've been an investor? See what you can learn, but do your own homework. And Isaac, in terms of the mechanics of that, do you tell the investor, hey, I'm going to, you know, give me a list. I'm going to talk to some of your portfolio companies, or do you just get on their website, look at their portfolio companies and call them up uh, unsolicited? The second one. Otherwise, they'll just give you the folks they are getting along with really well. Yeah. Um, now, do you find your way in on your own, I would say. Right. Uh, David, in terms of, um, in terms of, did you run into some VCs at the early stages and say, look, I don't even want a board seat. Uh, you know, that, that comes with fiduciary duties. I want to be in the room. I want to be helpful to the company. I want to open up my virtual Rolodex, but I prefer not to be a, you know, I'd rather be an observer than a board member. Do you, do you run across that a lot, David? Or, or you I know, it, I, I wouldn't say you run across that a lot, but it, I, I, I've observed that to be an increasing phenomenon. Um, and um, it's also one of the other uh, uh, phenomena is, I mean, you, you've got different fiduciary responsibilities depending on different, uh, different roles and different, uh, different forms of, uh, of organization. Um, but, you know, in, in, I think even with observers, um, you need to be careful because even though there may not be a fiduciary duty and uh, you can have issues of what's the board dynamic. You want, you want a very robust and productive board dynamic. Um, and, you know, the sad thing is, and, and I think Isaac's point about, you know, what are these people like to have on your board? Fact of the matter is, you know, on that board, you do have a, a fiduciary duty uh, that transcends just protecting your particular interest, um, and you know, you have a you have a fiduciary duty to the interest of the company and to and to all the shareholders, um, and I, I think if you set that tone early in terms of how a board operates and how a board is expected to operate, it can, it can, be, uh, it can be very helpful. The other aspect where I think um, experienced directors, uh, whether, from, uh, whether from a venture fund or outside directors can really help is, is in the, the process of governance and the process of making the use of the board a very uh, you know, efficient, process uh, for developing strategy, solving problems, because that really needs to be, a, that me needs to be a very, very uh, a high functioning thing, because entrepreneurship is a really, really lonely place. And a, a good board and good investors uh, with whom you've got a good relationship and good dialogue 
um, can really make a lot of difference. So David, I, I tend to, you know, we've had more and more people trying to be board observers, you know, asking for that type of rights. What are the reasons that I shouldn't do that? I tend to be kind of, you know, sure, I don't mind as long as you're seen but not heard, um, pretty transparent with everybody. What are, what are the pitfalls of, of bringing on too many observers or giving that right away too cheap? From my perspective, is you, you, there is a potential for having too many people in the room, right? whether it's a virtual room or a real room, just in yeah. terms of you know, kind of a, you know, being overly cumbersome. Now, some people might say, look, the more voices, the better. You know, I'm more likely to get a good idea if I've got you know, 10 people uh, uh, piping up than if I've got five. Uh, and, and, and when you have uh, more folks in the room um, and you'll have with your observers, you'll have confidentiality obligations and all that. It does make it more likely, though, that despite all of your contractual protections and despite your fiduciary duties, that things might seep out that you don't want to seep out. So those are potential uh, pitfalls beyond the fact that you got to buy more Danish for the board meeting uh, any given morning. Yeah, and I, let's, let's I would echo, let's, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Dave. I, I, I would echo that. I think those are exactly the issues. It's sort of it's a group dynamic, and it's there. There are some risks associated. Uh, with with observers, and there's certain stuff that depending on depending on who the observer is. So, for example, you might have an observer from a uh, you know from a strategic uh, where you know there's certain stuff where you don't want them in the room. Uh, and I wouldn't hesitate to kick them out in that context. Yeah. I mean, it, it, there's you know no, and, and people will appreciate that. Your other board members will appreciate that if there's if there's a conflict situation. And when I say kick them out, I mean politely, obviously, but asking folks to recuse themselves from those discussions is per perfectly appropriate. Let me go back to Aroma again, though, just to, and I think we can spend a lot of time on the board, maybe we'll come back to it, but Aroma, anything else you want to talk about in terms of the kind of the, the general terms beyond valuation and some of these control issues that we've been talking about, drag-alongs, tag-alongs, other, other issues in the term sheet? Yeah, I think anti-dilution is something um, important to touch on. Um, it's, it's often... Um, Something that I think a lot of companies aren't necessarily thinking of because um, none of us want um, the, the company to have a down round um, in the future. But um, anti dilution is a mechanism to reprice the stock to protect the investor's position in the event that there is a down round um, in the future. Um, and there's a couple ways to um, price out adjustment um, through either full ratchet or broad based weighted average. Um, I won't go into detail here, um, but I mean, I think both David and Mark mentioned the NBCA documents, and um, I think if you go to the NBCA documents um, term sheet and, and uh, form of um, a charter, um, they have very detailed explanations of, of what the difference, differences are in, in calculating those, um, the, those adjustments um, from full ratchet compared to broad-based uh, weighted average. Um, but the gist of it is that um, the adjustments are applicable to subsequent equity issuances at a lower valuation um, than that paid by the investor. And those subsequent issuances, can, you gotta be careful because they could include you know, granting warrants as, as kickers in the context of an equipment financing or something. So you need to yeah. look at the, you need to look at how the anti-dilution provision works, make sure there are appropriate carve-outs in the provision Ultimately, when you, it's more when you get to the definitive document stage uh, and yeah. make sure you don't inadvertently trip. Yeah. And again, some of the not to be an advertisement, but <clears throat> it's where good counsel makes a big difference. Because um, these, these are some of the things on which you can trip if you're not well advised. Okay. Aroma, other items you want to cover on the term sheet? Yeah, just some of the key liquidity, uh, the, the key liquidity terms like drag along and, and tag along rights. Um, uh, for drag along, the, um, it's often structured so the majority of uh, stockholders can force the minority stockholders to sell their shares in a sale of the company if they um, if they all receive the same consideration. There are some um, more detailed points with respect to drag along that I think. Um, are often negotiated in terms of what other sort of um, uh, controls the minority shareholders can have um, in, in the event of a drag-along um, transaction. Um, and then there's tag-along rights, which um, really affect um, often the founders of the company, where a majority of stockholders can 
join the sale of the founders or other key persons um, uh, in, the in the company's uh, sale to a third party. Um, and uh, that, that is um, often with respect to um, the right of first refusal and, and co-sale agreements. Okay, great. Um, well, we've, we've hit the 50 minute mark. I think we can continue on if, uh, if folks don't have other places to be. I, I don't see any other questions. I, um, you know, David or Isaac or Roma, do you have any other nuggets of advice for uh, management or you know, entrepreneurs or founders of early stage companies as to how to deal with prospective investors uh, in the context of the term sheet negotiation and, and, and otherwise? There was one question that came in um, just, just a minute ago um, asking in, in the term sheet, is there any differences in term sheets versus are from VCs or a strategic? Well, I think, I think you know, in, in, in general, um, you know, most VCs will have their own forms. I mean, some will, some will trigger and key off of the NBCA documents. Again, I think the NBCA documents, a lot of the value there is it kind of lays out what are customary provisions and then describes that, you know, with annotations and footnotes, what they all mean. But VCs will have their own form, certainly strategic investors, uh, generally if they're the lead in a deal, will have their own forms. I mean, they're, they, I'm not so concerned, frankly, about the, the, uh, the form of the term sheet as, as the substance. And in the context of um, uh, strategics, you know, there may be other elements to the deal, whether it's, you know, licensing of technology, whether it's you know uh, you know enhanced rights to future equity, you know at an extreme maybe even a potential buy option, which I, I would think most entrepreneurs would want to avoid certainly at the early stages, but um, but corporate you know it's, it's, it's corporate venture capital generally have uh, you, you know each each different entity uh, each different strategic has its has its own form and its own way about of going about doing these transactions, but you know kind of the technology sharing for tech companies and and life sciences companies is usually an important element. Yeah, we've seen, or at least conventional wisdom would tell you that strategics tend to be a little less valuation sensitive. Um, but, you know, as you say, they each have their own special flavor, right? For some groups we've spoken with, they need to have kind of a strategic collaboration already done before they'll even talk to you. For others, it's purely financial. They're kind of firewalled off from the broader corporation. Um, so there, there's every single different flavor, but, but uh, broadly speaking, word on the street is they tend to be less valuation sensitive. Which, which can create some issues down the road uh, in terms of, uh, in terms of, because they can have other motivations as, uh, as uh, Mark was uh, uh, laying out. So you just need, to, you need to, to understand what their motivations are and what the implications are and what that's gonna mean for your financing prospects down the road. Um, yeah. Um, what are important points to consider after a term sheet is received? I don't, I don't know if this means after the term sheet proposal is received or after the term sheet is signed. Um, but after the term sheet, let's, let's just go to after the term sheet is signed, because I think we've talked about the process leading up to the term sheet getting signed. Um, Isaac, what, what, you know, What's what's the next step from your perspective? Term sheet signed. You want to get now. You want to get that money in as soon as, as possible. As the yeah, um, you know, make sure you run a professional process. Right, you're, you're going to have to have a formal data room that's that's really done up correctly. Make sure everything's there. You have your diligence checklist done before even you sign that term or have that term sheet sign that term sheet with the group. Um, and and again, you know, you're on call. You should be on call until the until the deal is done. Right, so. You'll likely have a team on the other side of the table. They'll have more bandwidth than you do. Um, they're going to be some sleepless nights trying to keep up with the process to make sure you get all the information on the other side that they need. I would say as well, so, you know, honesty, transparency, uh, making sure that you don't misstate everything or, or get caught saying one thing when you meant to say another. That's what screws up diligence processes is, is if you're, you're not covering something up, but maybe there's some smoke and mirrors involved with, with you and, and the facts. So just stick to the truth. Yeah, and that's great advice. Um, and the other thing to consider in the context of the term sheet is understanding in the course of the term sheet, and this, this will be reflected in the term sheet, what are the conditions to closing? 
um, you know, depending on uh, the environment and the in the market, you can have term sheets that that come in earlier than than later uh, because people want to lock up at a deal. So it's important to understand what's left. You know, what are the closing conditions? You know, do you need to convert from an LLC to a C corp? You know, what's the nature of diligence left to do? Uh, and you need to to work through that process very very efficiently, and it it doesn't do and and things then it's a process not only of you know you document the deal, uh, and you again work off of documents that are going to track the uh, track the term sheet into in in the material terms, so you're going to be negotiating your your definitive agreement you're going to be putting together your disclosure schedules uh and you're going to be completing diligence uh you know you may have other issues uh including uh, you know is there a syndicate to fill out you know is that is this term sheet for just the lead investor whose responsibility is it to to complete uh, uh you know complete a syndicate uh, so there, there are other things that are situational. Yeah, and I, I think it's fair to say, at least in my experience, most deals that get through term sheet get get to closing. I mean, I think, I think, and I think that it's more the case in venture financing, certainly early stage financings, uh, than it is in an M and A deal, for example, where a lot of times you'll have a letter of intent and the deal will break up because of diligence or, or any of a number of other issues between letter of intent and closing. Uh, but it, it's not a hundred percent. And so as the entrepreneur, as the company, you do want to be thinking about the possibility that the deal might not happen. And you want to be thinking about it in, in a couple of contexts. One, give yourself enough time. Don't say, well, I need money in 90 days. And I think the process is a 90 day process. So we can start at day one of a 90 day process. Give yourself more time than that. Um, and I gave a little bit of short shrift early on to the exclusivity provision. Try to keep that as tight as you can. I mean, if, if, if it's reasonable for this deal to close in 30 days, give them 30 days if you can, not 60 or 75, uh, so that you can move on if it looks like it's not going to happen. Again, usually these transactions, particularly at the early stage, close, but, but not always. And I, I think Angus sent something out to the attendees. If, you know, if people have questions offline, uh, certainly, uh, you know, feel free to direct them to, to anybody. Yeah, we, I think we've hit the, the four that were raised. Um, so unless any of our panelists have anything else, I want to thank the audience and, and of course, thank the, the panelists uh, uh, for, for doing, a, doing a great job.